In this nugget, we're going to apply the concepts from the King A, King B story to computer networks. Let's begin. One of the interesting attributes I'd like to point out about this King A and King B story that we went through in the previous nugget is that the king only interacts with and only talks to the scribe. The king doesn't jump down and talk to like the middle manager or the mailroom. He only works directly with the scribe. And then the scribe has a relationship not only with the king, but also with the 007, the agent. And the 007 agent and the attorney also communicate with each other. But you'll notice that the attorney doesn't talk directly to the scribe or vice versa. They are going through the 007 agent. And then the attorney works directly with the middle manager as well as the agent. And the middle manager in the mailroom. They communicate with each other. And the mailroom and the envelope stuffer also communicate with each other. And the envelope stuffer has access, I move the truck over here, to the carrier who's actually going to be moving that information. Now, let me tell you one of the cool benefits about how this organization is set up. If we wanted to get a new carrier, let's say we're going to use some other carrier instead of FedEx. Let's say we're going to use UPS as an example. How hard would it be for Kingdom A to start using UPS instead of FedEx? Well, in our story, the only direct interaction that we have with the carrier is the envelope stuffer. So all we'd have to do is swap out FedEx for UPS, and we would not have to bother anybody here because they're isolated and separated from the delivery. The same is true for a scribe. What if we wanted to replace the scribe? How hard would it be? Would we have to redo the entire kingdom? The answer is no. We take the old scribe out and we bring a new scribe in. And that new scribe would have interaction with just the king and the 007 agent. And as a result, the lawyer, the middle manager, the mailroom, and all the other layers wouldn't have to worry about that change. Because to those other layers, because they're separate and removed from the scribe process, it wouldn't matter to those other layers, those other functions that are isolated or abstracted from the scribe. Now we can take that same type of analogy where the king talks to the scribe, the scribe talks to 007 and so forth, and we can apply that to how a computer thinks before it sends data on a computer network. And when I say a computer, I'm referring to any type of computing device that is connected to and working with a network. And to help get our brain wrapped around the logical idea of what goes on in the computers when they're communicating on a network, we can apply the various roles in Kingdom A and Kingdom B's castles to individual functions that go on on a computer network. And to assist us with that, we have something called the OSI Reference Model. It stands for the Open System Interconnect Model. And it really is just a model or an idea of how we can categorize functions that go on inside of a device that's communicating on a network. And there are seven specific functions or layers as they're referred to in the OSI Reference Model. And these layers or functions are numbered. They start at the bottom, just like professional brick layers. When they build a wall, where do they start? At the bottom, sure enough. And they're numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for these seven different roles or functions, if you will, that can work together in what's referred to as a protocol stack, a set of rules or a set of protocols that work together. So protocols is nothing more than a fancy word for a set of rules that are agreed upon. So the scribe in our scenario represents what's called the application layer in the OSI reference model. It's providing services. For example, somebody wants to print a printing service. Somebody wants to save a file, a file service. The application directly interacts with the presentation layer. So if there's a request of the application layer, that's then handed down to the presentation layer, which represents our 007, our James Bond. So if we're doing things like encryption, decryption, and translation services, that's referred to as layer six or the presentation layer in the OSI reference model. Again, it's just an idea about categorizing functionality inside of a computing device that's connected to a network. 
So if there is some encryption or translation that needs to happen, logically, that's where it could happen at layer six. And then the presentation layer hands it down to layer five, which is our attorney. And this is the logical function that it can set up our sessions. For example, if the user, we'll call the user King A, who's using a browser, wants to connect out to a web server, it's the session layer's responsibility for managing that session. And you know what? King A doesn't go to just one website. He may have three or four websites open at the same time. So the session layer would have the ability to manage multiple sessions. So if King A was going out to Google.com, it would be a session between King A's computer and the web server at Google.com. And then the session layer hands it down to the next responsible party in getting the job done, and that is our middle manager. Now the middle manager is layer four of the OSI reference model, and it has a name, it's called the transport layer. So just like our middle manager in the King A, King B story, if there's a big chunk of data that's coming down, maybe it needs to be chopped up or segmented into smaller chunks. And if the middle manager is doing reliable delivery, the transport layer may add additional information to those segments, including things such as sequence numbers. And the transport layer would be expecting receipts from the other side to indicate, yes, those packages, those segments of data made it over to the other side. Now, I want to point out something here at the transport layer. If the transport layer is adding additional information, for example, one of two and two of two, the information is getting slightly larger as it's being sent down the stack. And that's often what these are referred to as a protocol stack, a set of rules that interwork with each other. And the process of one layer handing it down to the next layer and handing it down and handing it down, that process is called encapsulation. And each layer, as it gets it, if it has to add a little bit of information, it will add that information usually in something called a header, a little extra information at the beginning as part of that encapsulation. So the transport layer then would send its information down to layer three of the OSA reference model, which is called the network layer. And the network layer, layer three, just like the mailroom, is responsible for creating the labels, the source address and the destination address regarding this packet, this data that's going to be sent. So just like the mailroom in our analogy, we had a street name and a house number, or in case of the king, the castle number. The network layer is responsible for adding on the IP source address and the IP destination address. And once it does that, it then hands that information down to the data link layer, which is the envelope stuffer. And what the data link layer does, it also adds information. For example, on an Ethernet network, we have layer two Ethernet addresses, also referred to as media access control or MAC addresses. So layer two of the OSI reference model on an Ethernet network is going to attach a source and destination layer two address. The source address would be where this frame is coming from, and the destination would be where this frame is going to. What's the next immediate destination we need to send this to? Is it another device on this local network? Is it my default gateway? And then with that information added, it's handed down to layer one of the OSI reference model, which is the physical layer. And the physical layer is all about sending that information. And the physical layer would include things such as the physical cables, the connectors, the electronic signals that are being sent as that information is now put on and traveling across the network. And then as that information is sent to its recipient, the recipient is going to receive that and start to de-encapsulate. So at the receiving side, for example, just for a moment, let's say this is now the receiving side. The receiving side would receive the bits. It would take a look at the layer two address and say, yep, that's us. It would then de-encapsulate the information handed up to the network layer on the receiving side. Who would look at the layer three address and say, yep, that's us. It would then hand it up to the transport layer where the middle manager says, yep, we'll accept that. 
which then gets handed up to the session layer, app presentation layer, and application layer. And the process here, as we receive the data and we strip off the headers and the extra information that was added, that receiving process is called de-encapsulation. So sending the information, we're doing encapsulation as we prepare to and send the data, and the receiving party is going to do de-encapsulation as they receive and process the information. Now, as cool as the OSI reference model is, it is just a reference model, meaning don't go out and expect to see a protocol stack that exactly matches the OSI model because it's kind of like just an idea. And several decades ago, when the internet was just being born, the developers were creating this protocol stack called TCP slash IP. And these are all acronyms. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. We'll have a separate nugget just about that. And the IP stands for Internet Protocol. And again, we'll have separate nuggets with more details on those acronyms. But this is the protocol stack that they built and were using. And they didn't bother separating the functions for layers 7, 6, and 5. They just lumped it all together and they called it the application layer. And then the middle manager, they did indeed call that the transport layer. And for the mailroom, they called that the internet layer as opposed to network layer. So a slight difference in terminology there. And for the bottom two layers, they refer to this as the network access layer, which combines the aspects of sending the bits, the cables, the connectors, as well as the layer two addressing on ethernet, such as MAC addresses and the rules of the road for how to gain access to the network. Those are all bundled together. And possession is nine-tenths of the law. <laughs> and because TCPIP was in use and it was being developed and enhanced, even though the OSI reference model was also out there, they didn't bother going back and saying, well, let's rewrite the TCPIP protocol suite to exactly match the OSI reference model. So pretty much the world today uses the TCP IP protocol suite for most of their communications, including the internet. And where it gets a little bit interesting is the actual layers that we refer to in our TCP IP protocol stack today. So this right here, this actual, I'm going to label it TCP IP. And in our current TCP IP protocol stack today, the upper three layers of the OSI reference model are all represented by this one layer called the application layer. And that's great news. So layers five, six, or seven, just refer to it generally as the application layer. It's responsible for application layer services, translation, encryption, decryption, session management, etc. Everything that we'd find in five, six, and seven are all conveniently in one giant lump called the application layer in our current today TCP IP protocol suite. And the middle manager is simply called the transport layer. So that's great news, transport layer across the board. For the internet function of the TCP IP protocol suite, we borrow a couple of things from the OSI reference model. We borrow the name, so we call it the network layer inside the TCP IP protocol suite and we also borrow the number of three. So when people talk about, hey, this is a layer three device, they're talking about a device that primarily operates based on layer three address information. And in the TCP IP protocol suite, instead of just referring to the bottom two as network access, they borrowed the names and numbers from those two levels as well. So even though we're using TCP IP, which originally didn't have a data link and physical separated, we borrow the name and the number from the OSI reference model. So what it really is, is the TCP IP protocol suite, which is borrowing some names and numbers, for example, layer one, two, three, and four from the OSI reference model. However, at the end of the day, it really is just the TCP IP protocol suite. So let's take a look at an example of TCP IP protocol suite in action. Bob, the user, 
has a browser. Woohoo! Congratulations, Bob. We all have browsers. So he opens his browser and he goes out to Google.com. And when Bob is going out to Google.com in the background, DNS is running to resolve the name of Google.com to an IP address. So in reality, Bob's computer is connecting to the IP address of Google.com or one of Google.com's servers. And in that process, he's using a protocol, a set of rules at the application layer called HTTP, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. That is the language of love if you're communicating between a browser and a web server on the internet. So as Bob was establishing this session, in his computer, it formulated the perfect HTTP request. And then it handed that request down to the transport layer, which is layer four. Now, HTTP has some standards regarding the layer four protocols it wants to use. And the protocol it wants to use at layer four is called Transmission Control Protocol, or the acronym would be TCP. TCP is an example of a reliable connection-oriented layer four transport protocol because it's going to be asking for acknowledgments and receipts and synchronizing with the other side to verify that the data really did get to the other side. And that additional control that TCP is adding is going to add a little bit of overhead and it's going to do that in the form of a TCP header. And a header is the extra information that this layer is adding for the function of that reliability and tracking. And again, this process of adding additional header information at each of the layers is the process of encapsulation as the information is being logically sent down the protocol stack. Once TCP has added its information, it then hands it over to the mailroom, which is the network layer, layer three. And at layer three, we have one major protocol, and that is IP, the internet protocol. Now, there's a couple of flavors of IP, internet protocol. We have IP version four, which is the most prevalent, and we also have IP version six, which is getting more and more popular, mostly because we've exhausted most of our IPv4 address space. We don't have any more streets left, so we're moving over to IPv6, which has trillions of more streets that we can play with because it's a bigger IP addressing space. So at layer three, IP is also going to add a header. And then this header is going to be adding specifically the IP addresses, the source IP address and the destination IP address. If Bob's going to Google, it would be the destination IP address of google.com. And then it gets handed down to the envelope stuffer. And if we're on an ethernet network, which is very, very common. This is the envelope stuffer at layer two. And it is also adding header information. And in that header information, if we're on an ethernet network, we would be adding the source MAC address, the media access control address, also sometimes referred to as the layer two address. And then once that information is added, it's then handed down to the physical layer, logically, which is then sending that information like a telegraph operator on steroids. <laughs> Millions of times a minute on the network. Now, one of the things I found very helpful in my early career back in the 80s, <laughs> working with TCP IP and networks, and I still find helpful today, is getting some common ground with terminology. And one of the sets of terms I'd like to talk with you about and have you endorse and start using as well is what do we call this stuff that's being sent down the protocol stack at a specific level? For example, if we just took a snapshot in time and we just looked at this level, for example, layer three, which at this point includes the IP header information also already encapsulated is the TCP header information. But if we're focusing just on layer three, we could refer to that information up to that point as a packet. Now the word packet by our friends and our colleagues is used all over the place. It's a packet, got a packet, sending a packet. However, if we wanna to get to the nitty gritty and be more accurate in our descriptions 
of this data at various levels, we could refer to the IP header information and everything behind it. For example, the TCP header, which is already there, and the HTTP header, which is already there. We could refer to that as a packet. On the other hand, if we're focusing right here on the TCP header information, where maybe it hasn't yet been encapsulated by IP and doesn't yet have an IP address, we could refer to that as a segment, a segment of data. And as that segment of data is handed down and is encapsulated by IP and becomes a packet, and then IP hands it down to layer two, and layer two adds its header information. At layer two, we could refer to that as a frame, a frame of data, which includes the layer two header information. And on ethernet, again, that would be MAC addresses, layer two ethernet addresses. And then as layer two hands that down to the physical layer for the actual transmission of those bits at crazy, crazy speed, we just simply refer to that transmission of that information as bits a bunch of ones and zeros traveling across the media very, very quickly. Another cool byproduct of using these layer numbers, for example, layer one, two, three, and four, as we talk about the TCP IP protocol suite, is that if we have a device on the network that is primarily making decisions, forwarding decisions based on, for example, layer three information, which would be based on IP addresses, that would be called in our network, a layer three device. Now it just so happens that we have a name for these devices that make forwarding decisions based on layer three information, and that is a router. And that my friend is because a router makes forwarding decisions based on IP addresses. If it gets a packet, it looks at the destination IP address and it says, hmm, do I know how to forward that? And if it does, it forwards it. It re-encapsulates it and forwards it on to this next destination. If we had a device that was making forwarding decisions based on layer two information, we could refer to that as a layer two device. And it just so happens that we have a very common layer two forwarding device in our networks today. And that is referred to as a layer two switch. Specifically on an ethernet network, it takes a look at the destination layer two MAC address and it makes a forwarding decision based on that MAC address. So we could say that a switch, an ethernet switch is a layer two device, a layer two switch. And furthermore, we could say that the layer two switch forwards frames based on that layer two information that's in the header in those frames. And when we get down to the physical layer, we also have some devices that are associated with the physical layer. For example, a cable, a connector, the electrical signals that are being sent. Those are all examples of physical layer devices or layer one devices. We also have in this category something called a hub. And a hub kind of looks like a switch. It's got RJ45 ports. But with a hub, if somebody sends a signal in on one port, it simply blindly repeats it all on the other ports. A hub does not have any intelligence to look or understand layer two information. And for that reason, a hub would be considered a layer one device, simply like a glorified repeater repeating the bits that it sees out the other ports. And one other kind of interesting observation I'd like to make is regarding layer two devices. Let's consider a network interface card that's sitting in a computer. If it's a network interface card that's used on an ethernet network, it certainly does have physical connectors. I mean, we plug the RJ45 cable into the network interface card. So in that concept, a network interface card could be considered a layer one device. However, that same network interface card also has the layer two MAC address that's burned into it from the factory. It's also controlling a lot of the logic for gaining access to the network. And because of the layer two MAC address and the functions it has there at layer two, a network interface card would probably better fit into the layer two category as opposed to just a layer one. 
And I guess we could use that same argument with routers as well. Routers have physical interfaces, they have physical connectors, but because they make forwarding decisions based on layer three information, they're considered primarily to be a layer three device. So my friend, here is the takeaway. I would strongly recommend that you memorize the seven layers of the OSI reference model. To do that, here's a quick reminder tool. You could take the first letter from each of the layers and you could simply make up a cute saying such as, please do not throw sausage pizza away. If that works for you, great. Or make up another one and that way you can remember the first letter and that can help you remember the labels of the OSI reference model. I would also recommend that you do a little practice with the actual TCP IP protocol suite and the labels and names we associate with them. For example, layers one, two, three, and four, what the names are of the TCP IP protocol suite at those layers, as well as what we call the data at each of those layers, bits, frames, packets, or segments. Sometimes you also might hear these referred to as PDUs, which is a kind of a funny little acronym for protocol data units. Please don't say that in public. Because if we just want to refer to data at the application layer, we can just call it data. I would also have you remember that the router is a perfect example of a layer three forwarding device because that's its primary purpose. It makes forwarding decisions based on IP addresses at layer three. And that a layer two switch, an ethernet switch, is making its forwarding decisions based on layer two addresses, which is contained in the layer two headers. And that's why it's referred to as a layer two device. And as a challenge to verify that you have this down, I would recommend that you, without looking at this screen, go to a separate piece of paper or a separate drawing mechanism, draw out the TCP IP protocol suite, write out the layers, write out the names of the data at those layers, and the devices that commonly operate and make forwarding decisions at those layers as well. And I've got a secret for you. If you take the time now to actually write this out and practice it to really internalize it, that will serve you in so many ways. As you communicate with others regarding networking technologies, it'll also help you greatly if you're ever involved in troubleshooting a network because we can leverage this information as we take strategic approaches to fixing or solving a problem on a computer network today. I have had a lot of fun in this nugget. I'm glad that you joined me for it. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.